<laughs> I'm a little, yeah, well, we'll get through it. <laughs> Glad y'all are here this evening. We're, we are going to continue our study in Isaiah chapter 51. So we can uh, go ahead and turn there and let's go to the Lord. Thank you, Father. We thank you so much, Lord, that we just, we depend on you. We know that you are our source, our strength, our hope. We know, Lord, that we can come to you in times of need and distress, in times of that we're tired, you're our rest. And we just thank you that we are here tonight together. And we just ask, Lord, that you speak to us through your word as we continue our study and and just searching for your heart here, Lord. That's what we do. We come searching for your heart because we want to get rid of ours and replace it with yours so that we are walking, abiding, living, and acting as we should. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our last study, we saw Israel uh, was angry with God, accusing him of abandoning them or divorcing them, if you will. But God called them out of it. See, one thing about it, you know, you can be a spoiled little brat all you want, but God's not going to let you get away with it. And God will call you out just like he called them out. And he said to them, he said, show me these divorce papers. You know, show me the bill of sale. Where did I sell you into captivity? God didn't sell them into anything. They sold themselves. And as always, as it is then, as it is today, man abandons God. God never abandons man. It was Adam who abandoned God in the garden. All the way back to the beginning. He knew the truth. He knew God's commandments. And yet he chose a lie. It was Adam that hid from God, but it was God that sought him out. In Genesis 3, 8 through 9, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? You know, that speaks volumes to us today. You can say that God's abandoned us. We can say that we're upset with him because things aren't easy or comfortable. We can say that life is hard, and some of those statements are true. Life is hard. It is hard, and sometimes things are uh, tough for us. But it's us that hides from God because Adam made a choice to take the fruit that he knew that God had commanded him not to take. And once he did, his eyes were open. They realized they were naked. They were ashamed. They were fearful. All of those things that they had never experienced before were wide open to them at that point, And they were controlled by those emotions. Their spirit went to sleep. Their flesh was awakened. And they hid from God. But God always searched them out. And he searches us out. He's calling today. For today, for those who are, are, are thinking we're hid or thinking that we're uh, trying to do, do something on our own and just leave God out of it, he's calling for us and say, listen, don't do it. You know, I'm here. I've never abandoned you, and I never will. Now, we also saw the prophetical word of Jesus himself in our last study, giving us insight on the, his coming as the Messiah and touched on some of what he would suffer. For you and for me, knowing his beard was going to be plucked out. He was going to be spit upon uh, and beaten and all of those things. And again, as I mentioned last time, we're going to see more of his suffering when we get to Isaiah 53. And finally, we saw a choice that was given. Turn to the Lord from our darkness and receive the fullness of his blessing. Or walk in our own path and suffer torment from his hand. Now, we did cover, you know, that word does say the torment comes from his hand, but it's not because he's abandoned, sold us, or done anything to us. It's the response to sin. See, God can't deal with sin without taking care of it. And if there's sin in our life, he's going to take care of it. He's going to address it. He's going to address what's going on. And so, therefore, when it says the torment comes from his hand... The torment comes as a result of us abandoning him. And when he calls us back and is calling for us, his hand does sometimes come against us. He wants us to be awake, awakened to truth. He wants us to, to wake up to him and his word and, and not go the, the way that our flesh wants to take us. So this week, we're going to see his comfort for his people and how he removes his anger and fury from them. 
So let's begin. Isaiah 51, beginning with verse 1. Listen to me, you who, are follow, you who follow after righteousness. You who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hung, and the hole of the pit from which you were, you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For I, the Lord, for the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So, who has any thoughts on these verses? He's comforting. That's right. After he's dealt with them on their own lie about where they were, why they were in captivity, all the things that they were going through, he's telling them, listen, first off, I didn't do this to you. You did it to yourselves. But I love you. It's like this hurts me more than it should hurt you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, your parents always said that, but you never believed it. No, no. It always hurt me pretty much at the time. I was, I never did believe that one. But, you know, the thing is, is that God comforts those who follow after righteousness. Look how he addresses this. He said, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. See, what he's saying is, is there's still a distinction. Now, we're dealing with a nation here. God is dealing with a nation. In the church, he deals with the church, but also individual, because the individuals make up the church. So he has to deal with the individuals, sometimes individually, and then if that's affected the church, he has to deal with the whole corporate church as well. But here he's saying, listen, listen to me who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. He's saying only those who are really seeking me are going to find me. And if you're seeking me, I'm giving you this comfort. So while there's comfort offered, it's only offered to those who want to receive it because they want him and his righteousness, not just because they want to escape the trouble they're in. And there's a big, big difference on how we approach God. And many, many times, myself included, I think all of us can say, we've been in trouble, and we're seeking the Lord. We're seeking the Lord. Get us out of this trouble. Get us out of this trouble. And the Lord is saying, I want to get you out of that trouble, but I need you to seek me more than you're seeking to escape what you're going through. Are you seeking righteousness? Are you following after that? Are you seeking the Lord? And then he goes on. He says, look to the rock which you were honing, the hole of the spirit which you dug. Look to your history. Look to your roots. Get back to where you're, where you're, ground, you're grounded. And you're grounded in me. You're not grounded in anything else. And what he's telling Israel here, he said, let's go back to the beginning of Israel. Let's go back to Abraham. I called him alone. I called him alone. And blessed and increased him. And then he goes on and says what he will do to comfort them. But he comforts those who follow after righteousness. Calls them to remember where they came from. And he restores them the land to its fullness from its barren, barrenness to fruitful. And, and you know even today you can see in Israel there are places that were desert. They're actually growing now. They're fruitful. You even see the effects of that today in Israel. I think it's going beyond that. I think it's going to be to the full restoration when everything is, is said and done. But, I, but, this is all, but, but his word, it, it never returns void, and it always comes through. So he's bringing comfort to those who were not, uh, not obedient, to those who were rebellious, but to those who want him and desire him. This is the comfort that he brings. Any other thoughts on those? Garden of the Lord in verse uh, three. I just I, I, or, or they one the same. I think um, from reading this, and I did read, read and study over this a little bit. He can make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the Garden of the Lord. I believe he's referring back to where the wilderness would be like it was in the beginning. Mm. In other words, he's going to restore in full. This will not take place on this earth at least not until he mm -hmm. takes reign for the thousand years. Mm -hmm. And during that thousand year reign, I believe a lot of these earthly things will be restored mm -hmm. then. 
but when this earth is completely removed, it's going to be like back in the garden. I mean, if you go back, if you go to Revelation, I think it's in 20 or 21, where he talks about, you know, the new Jerusalem and the fruit that, gro that grows on both sides of the river. And that fruit continuously grows. And there's, you know, just constantly growing fruit. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of fruit they've got there. You know, but it's just going to be continually growing all season, never ending. And, and you think about that, that's the way it was in the garden. There was constantly food and constantly growth for them. There was no, they weren't eating animals at the time. They, you know, they were tending to them and they were tending to the garden, but were not really tending. I mean, think about it, you know, even though, you know, Adam was tending, he was, he, what, what did it mean to tend the garden when you're in God's garden? That's perfect. <laughs> you just walk through and nod a little bit. You didn't have to weed. If there were insects, they were all just doing what had, what, I don't know, I don't even know if there were bugs then. That's, who knows? You know, I mean, we can go on about what was and what wasn't, but the perfection, the perfection of the garden is what it's saying here. I will make her wilderness like Eden, just like it was in the beginning. The place of peace, the place where there's no sin, the place where there's where growth is, is, is prevalent, and really there's no death. And that's the way it was in the Garden of Eden. So I think that's what, the, what he's referring to here. And I, I took it just like, just geography. Eden was the was the space, and within Eden was the garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can look at it that yeah. way. You can look at it the way. Garden was in Eden, the Garden of Eden. So yeah, Eden was the place. Um, but the wilderness would be uh, it would be a place too. But there's things that are going to happen in that yeah. wilderness, like it did in Eden. Yeah. And, um, and I'm reading a book by David Jeremiah. It's called The Agents of the Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And in there and stuff, he talks about in Revelation where it talks about the millennial reign. And it says that when the millennial reign takes place, that will be, things will return back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden. Mm. So during and, that thousand years, we're yep. talking about going back to that, to that mm -hmm. perfect place. Yeah. I do know this, there will still be sin in the world sure. during that thousand year reign. Unlike Eden, there was none until they, they took of the fruit that they were commanded not to. So I believe that that there will be things restored in that same manner, that gardens will grow, the place will be perfect because of Jesus' presence. But there will still be evil abound. Because there's still a flawed. There's still a flawed, yeah. Creation. And they still will be people in that reign that have not accepted him. Right. And so, you know, so this is... Um, there, you know, and then of course the last big rise up at the end of the thousand year reign, and then the final battle, and then it's all said and done. But um, but yeah, so I, I agree with that in part, and not that I'm, com I'm I mean I, I trust what he's saying is accurate, David Jeremiah. But but again, you know, you still have to look. There will be that difference until there will still still be sinful man running around. Mm -hmm. They're forced to obey. Right. They won't have no choice, but they won't like it. And uh, unlike the Eden in the beginning, there was all peace, all joy, all love, all perfect, all perfect in every aspect until they took of that fruit. Yes. He can't be impeached. <laughs> What's that? He can't be impeached. That's right. <laughs> and, yeah. Let, let let Pelosi try that one. Let's see how that works out for the house. That house will fall. <laughs> That's funny. He cannot be impeached. Pastor. Mm. Pastor. Verse four. Ready. Oh. I just wanted to say something. Oh, I'm some, sorry. No, no, it's all right. I was just, I don't know if this is taking it wrong or not, but um, I get comfort out of just reading, knowing that even if I see everything as waste, you know, as we see everything going spiraling down, it looks like a waste place. It looks like a desert. Mm -hmm. But just knowing that God can restore and revive that. Oh, you know, yeah. So that that is a me. good way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing happening in the world around us is what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. It's the depravity. It's sin. It's all going to spin downward until it, it, it just implodes upon itself. That's exactly what the Bible says it's going to do. And Jesus then is going to rise. And when he rises and he deals with it in according to his plan, the way it's going to be, then when he does come back and reign, yeah, he's going to restore all that. And that is, that is good news for us. Mm -hmm. It is real good news. And we have that hope. That's something we can hang on to. That while things are happening that we don't like, we wish weren't going on, we even pray that God would turn the country around because it's not the way it was founded, and it's not wrong to pray that way. Uh, even in the world, we pray that God would push back the enemy, 
that we still have more season of, of peace and, and, and his presence, but the line is drawn. Mm -hmm. We just don't know where that line is. Mm -hmm. So is it wrong to pray for that? No. Is it wrong if we don't get it to be upset with God? Yes. <laughs> because he's, it's his plan. Mm -hmm. It's his story. He's written it. Who are we to try to rewrite just because we don't like being a part of something that's not going to be real comfortable? But we do have a relationship, and when you're seeking him humbly and asking him to restore, I believe that's okay to do. And whether he says yes or no is really up to him. But he's got a plan, and we can, we can believe in, and hold on to that plan. And verse 4, listen to nice. people and give ear to me. O oh, oh my nation, for law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as a light of the people's. My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever. And my righteousness will not be abolished. Listen to me, you who know righteousness. You people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. So what are your thoughts on these verses? The earth will wear out like a garment. Could you call that climate change? <laughs> you could. The, you but, could, but, but it's by fighting, God's hands, not by ours. They're fighting yeah. the fact that this is his plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and think about it. That's a very good point because it is a cult. It is a belief mm -hmm. system, and they're, they're, they're God deniers. That's right. They're basically mm -hmm. saying man can fix everything. That's right. And so they're depending back upon themselves exactly the same problem that every, historically, every country, every nation, even Israel themselves have come, found themselves in different places. They depend, they come to the place where they try to depend upon themselves to fix their problems. And God says, no. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, the earth's going to burn up. It's going to be by his hand. And who's their idol? Exactly. Yeah, the earth and the and world. The they worship the world. They worship themselves. Exactly. And so, yeah, that's exactly right. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those things to where they can, they can plan and everything that they do is backfiring on them. That's right. Mm -hmm. All these plans. I mean, I don't know if you guys heard, because um, it hadn't been highly reported, but in Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the guys over OPEC, I don't know his title, I didn't catch his title, mm -hmm. but he made a statement and he, he basically called Biden out. And what he said was, he said, you know, he said he deliberately used up all the oil supplies and reserves in our country, specifically for political purposes. Now, this is the guy over OPEC saying he sees it what it is. He says he expects me and us to produce more oil. He said, but, but we're not going to. We're not going to do, what, do something to fix his problem that he created and it's going to cause much suffering and much problem in the future. I mean, that, that's a general statement of what he said. This is the this is a guy over OPEC that that's he sees what's happening. In other words, but what he's basically saying is, the leadership of this country has deliberately done something to bring it down. And this is a deliberate plan. This is all part of the cult of the climate change group, and they're in power right now. And so this is what's happening. How far will it go? Well, I don't know. This may be just one avenue. There's others that, that are the same, uh, same problem. But this is our leadership. God allow them to be in power. Mm -hmm. But God is still sitting on the throne. Amen. And so we depend upon him. Yeah. One thing I like <clears throat> that, that, that stuck out to me was the, uh, the, that God will be the supreme judge. Mm -hmm. He's the supreme judge. He, 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 the law stops with him, he, and he is the truth. And so there won't be any debate. There won't be anything about, uh, well, um, not, no absolute, because everything is going to be an absolute. Mm -hmm. 
And so people better make up their mind and realize that uh, they better come to him and get straight. Yeah, and many will. But we know basically by what Revelation tells us is many won't. As soon as Satan is released from his pit, there will be people that chase right after him. And nations, some of the nations will chase right after him. As though they can now come back. After a thousand years of seeing God reign perfectly, or Jesus reigning perfectly for that thousand years, Satan now is thinking he's going to convince people he can overthrow it. And to their detriment. But you're right. That is, you know, they will see that. They will see that perfect, per perfection, the absolute. And this is basically verses 4 here through 8. Is their prophetic. It's a prophetic word about the tribulation. Spoken by Daniel and in the book of Revelation. And it's about his eternal reign. And in the midst of that, this is why he tells us, listen, don't be afraid of evil men. These things are going to happen. Evil's in the world. It's going to be there. Again, be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. Remember, Jesus has already overcome all of this. We have to kind of go through it because we're in this earthly tent. And while we go through these things, we're going to see all of this stuff take place. It, it, and, and some of it we may see if he comes back before we, we, we uh, actually die and move on into, into his presence. But he tells us, listen, whatever's going on, don't be afraid. What can man do to you? And this is repeated so many times in Scripture. Psalm 56, 11. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Mm -hmm. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And then Hebrews 13, 6 tells us, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? These are three different passages that were that in three different places that are repeated because God wants us to grab a hold of the concept that we don't have to be afraid of what we see happening around us. No matter who's in power, no matter who's elected, no matter what's going on, no matter what laws are passed, no matter, it doesn't matter. He's still in control and we belong to him. We belong to him. We are his sheep. He is our shepherd. We hear his voice. So when all the other voices are raising up and threats are coming and fear ensues, all we have to do is come back to the basic understanding we have Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to fear anything else? Perfect love cast out all fear. Jesus is perfect love. We have him. We have his spirit. We have the word of God. What can man do to us? Oh, he can kill you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That just puts us in the hands of Jesus that much sooner. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not running around with a banner, take me, kill me. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that there won't be a moment of fear when that moment may come. What I'm saying is, is that we have the word of God to stand upon when that time comes. Mm -hmm. But think about it now. There are people right now in our country who are Christians who are afraid to leave their house yes. because of something going on in the neighborhood, something going on on the streets, something going on in town, something going on with COVID, something going on here, something going on there. Mm -hmm. I can't leave the house. Well, that's, that's bondage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that there's not something that's real that, 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 that they need to deal with, but many people would rather stay in that place than even approach help to get out of it. And that's not where, where we should be as a believer. We should never be in bondage to fear about what's going on around us. Yeah. You know, you, you, you know, you're talking about that. I think, and I, and I, it just, it just hit me about Stephen. You know how he's being stoned, but yet still had that forgiveness, and yet Paul was even there, or Saul was even there during that time. Mm -hmm. So even in Stephen stoning, there was a heart of forgiveness there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He was forgiving those, you know, around him who was doing the stoning. And Saul standing there giving the consent. They were laying their garments at Saul's feet. He was given approval. And the next thing he did is he went to the, went to the, uh, the hierarchy and said, Hey, give me these letters that I can distribute down here in Damascus and all these other places. We'll go round these people up. We'll put an end to this thing once and for all. And then what happens? He meets Jesus. Changed everything. And the comfort in Stephen stoning is, what was he seeing? 
Yeah. He was seeing Jesus. All right. Yeah. I don't think he even felt the stuff. No, I doubt he did. I really, he said he just fell asleep. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, he said, and Jesus was standing too. Yes. He said, I see Jesus standing. That's one time. Most of the time, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the mm -hmm. Father. He's interceding, but Stephen saw him standing. Yeah. And that to me is important because he saw, I think Jesus arose for him to come. Yeah, yeah I believe that too. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, that, and so Stephen, yeah. Throw one more. <laughs> Get a bigger rock. I'm ready to go. I'm seeing Jesus. Yes. I mean, it's just, uh, it is. And, and, and he, he wasn't afraid. And think about everything that, he, that led up to that. I mean, he, he was filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking to this crowd that he knew was a rebellious crowd. And not only did he just preach truth to them, he called them out. Yeah. And they were so upset. They tore their clothes and went after him. And right along those lines, uh, there's a couple of thoughts I had. Number one was right after the first time that the uh, disciples were beaten, after the, the, uh, the leaders, the Sanhedrin warned them not to speak, and then he spoke again, and then he beat them. Mm -hmm. And it says they went, and they had a prayer meeting, and they cried out to God for boldness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the place was shaken again, mm -hmm. and they started speaking again. So I think about the fear and the... I remember when COVID was first came out, it was, the fear was palpable. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was like you felt it in the air. Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing that overcomes that is the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. yeah. and our, and our intimate relationship with Him and, yeah. and being together whenever we can to pray together. Right. The other thought I had on this was, our, my came to mind was 9-11, um, oddly mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Right after 9-11 and those towers came down, in New York City, of all places, the churches were, were full. And it takes, it, the verse here that came to mind was, um, where is it? My righteousness is near, my salvation, verse 5, my salvation is going forth, my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. It seemed to me like acts of judgment. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to take to... If anything's going to turn this country around, it was going to, it's going to take a move of God's spirit, but also it may require an act of judgment mm -hmm. of some form of kind to shake people up. Right. To shake the church up, to shake the and that's that in New York City that grabbed people's attention, seeing yeah. those buildings come down. Yeah. Right. And it was a little revival for a short time, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there was something happening. Yeah. So. You know, it's interesting because um, when you put that into that perspective, we watched the show years ago, and I don't. I don't think we watched it regularly. It was called Preppers. You guys have probably heard the show Preppers. And these Preppers are mindsets that they go out and they, each one of these groups, there's, there's factions of these groups. So it's like, it's like Christianity in a sense. There's all kinds of different denominations. <laughs> and each one of them has their own belief as to what the catastrophe is. But it's definitely coming. And some it's going to be the big, uh, the big um, volcano out there in Yellowstone. Or wherever out there, Caldera. yeah, it's going to come up and it's going to take out half the half the country when that happens, and you got to be ready. So they get all their stuff prepped and put away. Others say it's going to be global climate change and all, uh, all the hurricanes are going to come together one time, make one big one, wipe out the whole country. Others say it's going to be uh, other natural disasters, and then others it's going to be Russia or some other country coming in and taking over. And so you have all of these different things going on, and they're all preparing, they're all doing this stuff. And when something like that does happen, there is a group in the middle of all of that that will run to a religious experience. Mm -hmm. They will run to God. Now, whether it's, a, it's out of fear or there's a real seeking God, that's between him and them. But that always takes place when something happens. Mm -hmm. Any there's, time there's a catastrophe. And they also have the opposite. They'll run from God. They'll push him away and they're angry with him. But, but that is, that's the thing. And, and, and so you see all of these different things that could happen. And it could be any one of them or multiple. I mean, think about it. If God is really, look at what's going to happen in Revelation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's his wrath being poured out and, and full wrath against the sin over the world and sin, sin over man. But he has, he has revealed his hand of judgment in many ways throughout the world, throughout history. So it's not going to be to that degree. But he could take out any nation just like that mm -hmm. with a natural disaster. He could take out this country just like that we with whatever history. he chose. History, Vesuvius, too. Yeah. Too. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Right. And so, so I mean, we don't know how or when or what, but we know that you, I, I believe you've got a point there that, that it very well could be that there will be another big shakeup before his return. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that would just be to rearrange things to fall into the main plan mm -hmm. at the end. And this is something we all have to be aware of because he has to plan and judgment is coming. Uh, we have not been in a place in this country to stand strong in our faith with him as the church in this country. So why would, why would we not be affected by it? Yeah, oddly enough, that would be an act of mercy. It would. Mm -hmm. if, we just, if things just keep going on as they are, just stay asleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely something there. And when you're talking about being awake and sleep, these next verses, it really gets into that. Verses 9 through 11. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days and the generations of old. Are you not the arm that, ca that cut Rahab apart? Now, when it's talking about Rahab here, it's speaking uh, of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Rahab is a, is, a, is a term that they use for Egypt. Did you not, um, the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? Now, I'm going to get some thoughts on these verses, but I just want to say this. This is the people's response to God here. This is not God speaking. This is the people crying out to him. Hey, awake, God. Awaken. Put on that strength of yours, arm of the Lord, like it was in the old days when you cut Egypt and tore Egypt apart and we got out and wounded the serpent. Didn't you dry up the sea and the water of the great deep that we could cross over? This is Israel calling on God to stand up, awaken, as though he's gone asleep. <laughs> so do y'all have any thoughts on that? Well, God never sleeps, for one thing. Right. It may seem like it mm -hmm. when turmoil is going on around us, mm -hmm. and he'll let us go through things for a certain time to waken us up. Right, it's really yeah. the other way around, and yeah. we're going to get to that in a minute too. But you're exactly right. It's it's the it, the whole concept here is is hey, you know, God, we we're in bondage, we're in trouble. <laughs> Did you go to sleep? Help, help, wake up. We remember they're basically reminding God of what God has done, <laughs> as though He's forgotten. And this is human nature. It's human nature to come at something as though you're reminding the one or God or whoever about what they've done, all this stuff, they've never forgotten it. It's, it's you that's forgotten. You're really reminding yourself. You're really coming to the place of reminding yourself. Yeah, you know? yeah like you're saying, you know, the bottom line is a heart issue. You know, God's going to see, okay, you're calling on me, now let me see where your heart's at. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, and that's exactly going back to the beginning. Oh, you righteous! Oh, those who are seeking righteousness, you're seeking me. He wants to know where the heart is, and he already knows, but he wants the people to know. See, this is the funny thing about how God works with people. God always knows the attitude of every heart. Sometimes we deceive ourselves, and we come at God as though He's the problem. He already knows that we're the problem, but He has to get us to see it. And he's got to get us to understand, listen, you're, you're the one, you're saying this, but you're doing the very thing that you're accusing me of. And that's what they're doing in Congress. The ones who cry the loudest about somebody that's doing this and bringing charges against this, that, and the other, they're more in the bed of the serpent than the rest of them. But yet they're accusing somebody else. And when they're called out, oh, no, it doesn't apply to them. This is the heart, this is the attitude of man. And so what they're saying here is, God, you're allowing all this calamity without intervening. And again, they're reminding him of the previous miracles that he's done for them in the past as though he's forgotten them. And this reminds me of when Jesus was in the boat with his disciples and there's this terrible storm. It said that Jesus was napping, but being 100% man and 100% God, mm -hmm. I, I don't think he was napping like in the sense that we nap. And they're crying out, don't you care if we drown? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, ye of little faith. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, ye of little faith. Mm -hmm. So, verses 11 through 16. So the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. 
with everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die? And of the son of a man who will be made like grass? And you forget the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor. When he is prepared to destroy, and where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed. The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed. That he should not die in the pit, and that his bread should not fail. But I am the Lord your God, who divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, You are my people. Again, comforting words. Yeah. Any, any thoughts there? Basically, what he's doing, he's calling them out. They're, they're saying, where are you? Why are you asleep? Why are you not doing these things? And he's reminded them he already knows. He, he had forgotten all the things that he's done. He's given them the fact that, hey, look, I hold the past, but I also hold the present, and I hold the future. And this is what he's saying in these verses. That, Listen, you're looking at this from a very small tunnel vision mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you've been struggling by your own choice, by your own hand. Yes, you're trying to call me out and remind me of things I've already done. Listen, let me tell you what I've already done. I hold that. This is by my hand that these things took place. I'm the one who rescued you. I'm the one who delivered you from the hand of Egypt. I'm the one who did all of these things. And not only that, but I've got you right now. I've got you right now. And then he goes on, I mean, basically, and says, and I've got the future. It's all mine. See, this is, where, this is where our faith walk really needs to be examined on a daily, daily basis because mm -hmm. we, 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 there's not one of us who, you know, I don't need to show a whole of hands in here, but we're all believers here. We've all accepted Jesus. We all will say, yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. He's got me. He's got me for eternity. When I die, I'm going to be with Jesus forever. So I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to heaven. Absolutely. Okay, then why can't you pray and believe that he's going to handle these other little problems today? Why is a little suffering in this life so overwhelming? It's because we don't know anything else. And we come out of the fleshly mindset. Me, me, me. Even though most of us are growing out of that as believers, we still have that rooted in us, and he wants it out. And sometimes he allows his suffering so that we do get past ourselves. But there are times when even as strong believers, we're questioning God. God, I know you did. And it's not wrong to say, God, you did this, and you did this, and you did this. It's not that you're calling them out that he forgot, and it's basically standing on the promises of what he's already done and saying, I know if you did that, you can do this, and I'm going to sing hallelujah because you're already doing it. Mm -hmm. There's difference in that mindset than saying, God, if you've forgotten me, you just went to sleep and forgot me. Nobody cares. La, 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 blah, blah, blah. But they didn't mention how the Hebrews became obedient to God mm -hmm. before. Right. right. It's obedience. Mm -hmm. It's obedience. And there's the key. It comes back, and it goes all the way back again to the very beginning. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, exactly. you who seek the Lord. Basically, those who want to follow my commands and walk in obedience, you're the ones I'm talking to here. Here's where the comfort's coming. You but, can see where that group is going to get smaller and smaller. Yeah, and it, and, so, and it continues to do so. Yeah. But, you know, the sad thing is, in comparison to today, the church, too, is getting smaller and smaller. Absolutely. And, it's, and a lot of people would argue with that. Oh, man, there's churches booming everywhere. you got churches they have five services a day. Yeah, Is the Spirit there? Is the Word of God being taught there? I don't know. I'm not in a lot of these places. I pray it is. But I also see what's going on in our culture today. And those people that are claiming to be Christians don't even really know what it means. Many of them. They have no clue what it means to serve a holy God. Jesus can be whatever they want Him to be if they want Him at all. And most of the time, they don't. They really don't. In the in the clinic, just an aside, 
we have to ask them, if somebody puts Christian on their intake, we have to ask them, what is a Christian? We never get Je mm -hmm. Jesus, we love Jesus who died for my sins. We never, they don't mention sin. Mm -hmm. And the pulpit's not mentioning sin with the church where they're going. Right. No, that's right. It's not. So, verse 17, God turns it back around on them. Mm. And he's saying, awake, awake. <laughs> Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the, drunk the dregs of Cup, I'm sorry, of the cup of trembling and drained it out. There's no one to guide her among all the sons she has brought forth, nor is there any who take, takes her by her hand. I'm sorry, I'm a little getting ahead of myself. Nor is there any who takes her by the hand among all the sons she's brought up. These two things have come to you who will be sorry for you. Desolation and destruction, famine and sword by whom I will comfort you. Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets, like an antelope in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebu rebuke of your God. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. Mm -hmm. Thus says your Lord, the Lord and your God, who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it. But I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, Lie down that we may walk over you, and you have laid your body like the ground, and as a street for those who walk over. So basically, God is telling them, I mean, he's putting it flat out, flat out for them. He said, Listen, you guys have been drinking from my cup. My cup of fury has been in your hands. You're drunk, but not with wine. You're drunk on the fact of my cup of fury. You've drunk and you're, dream you're trembling. You drained it out. Think about that for a minute. He's telling Israel, the reason you're so messed up is because I have poured out my fury upon you because of your rebellion and your, uh, your, your sin and disobedience. This is where it's been. He's telling them flat out. It's not me who needs to wake up. It's you who needs to wake up. I'm awake and I have allowed this to happen and put this fury in these cups in your hand for you to get to the end of yourself he says um, let's go on to, uh, basically by whom will I comfort you your sons have fainted they lie at the head of all the streets like an antelope in a net they are full of the fury of the Lord the rebu rebuke of your God he's saying all these people who have rebelled have tried to fix their own problems, have tried to do their own things, they're thin to themselves. They're now laying at the streets. They have nothing to bring to the table because they were walking in rebellion. Here's the deal. I want to comfort you. I'm going to take this cup of fury away from you. But you've got to want it. Mm -hmm. Which goes back to the beginning. For those who want righteousness, for those who are seeking God. This is, this is for you. He says, I plead the cause of my people. And he says, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it. But he's not going to give it to the oppressors. And see, this is how God did <coughs> all through the judgment times of Israel. When they were in captivity, he blessed Babylon. Right. You know, he blessed all of these that came in. Were they, were they good people? No, they were evil people. But he used them for his purpose to bring judgment upon Israel, to protect Israel in many ways, and keep them kind of together as a group so they weren't scattered. But then, when he would deliver them, what would happen? He would turn on the oppressor. Babylon fell. <coughs> All of these other nations fell. Because God said, listen, I've used you long enough. Now I'm going to come back to my people and comfort them because they've been broken. And this is a place that, that we really need to understand. Brokenness is a place for healing. Mm -hmm. But if you're not broken, you can't be healed. Or if you don't accept that you're broken, you can't be healed. Yeah, yeah it's kind of neat when you talk about that. It's, uh, you, know, you think about David. You know, even during David's sin, how Israel, you know, uh, uh, fell short because of, because of David's sin. Mm -hmm. And when David repented, everything started to turn around. 
Yeah. I mean, David went through, David went through a lot during David's uh, downfall. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And you have to look at it too. His downfall created long-term consequences too. And that's something else that you have to understand. Yeah, God's fury will pour out. He will deal with it. He, if, if you repent, he forgives. But David's family was a mess because of it. <laughs> But he's such a loving God that he didn't leave Babylon without hope either because Daniel was there. That's right. And mm-hmm. how many times did Daniel just show God right. his presence? Right, exactly. And and then you had Persia and the same thing. Yes. He moved in there and, and, and he, you know, there was blessings Esther. there. Yeah. Esther, all of these people that God put into place where he needed them in very difficult times. I mean, Esther was the key in that whole story, right. you know, and she didn't necessarily want to be there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, he'll kill me if I go in there. Exactly. And what what did he say? He said, "Listen, you go. If you don't go, you know, God will bring it through somebody else, but you'll lose the blessing on it." Mm-hmm. And that's basically. And she did what what God had wanted her to do: spare the whole kingdom of Israel from Haman. Yes. And then what did he do? He turned it around and put it on Haman's right. neck himself, and he hung on the own gallows that he had built. Yeah. This is how God works, and so. You have to understand, though, we're talking years of oppression. It wasn't just a a two-week deal and then they're out of it. When they went in, 400 years in Egypt, you know, and then you've got, uh, you know, 70 years in Babylon and other years, 40 years, 50 years here, all through their history, years went by. Now, you're talking about whole generations have to die out. And here we are today in our country, we're saying, Lord, when, how, what? I mean, we haven't even gone into tribulation with, I mean, not tri- persecution the way that the other world, the rest of the world's going into it yet. And yet, we're afraid. But he we said to Moses, I've heard my people cry out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So generations had to pass away. Exactly. And it got so bad. Right. And that was pretty much it in the very beginning when he got them out of Egypt. That whole generation had right. to die out. Right. He wasn't, I mean, That's 40 right. years they marched around in circles. <laughs> And what, a week, two-week journey maybe? I don't know for sure in the distance. Three? Yeah, I mean, boom, they're there. And here they are 40 years later. Now, he had mercy on them there. Their clothes didn't wear out. Sandals didn't wear out. He provided manna. He provided quail. He provided whatever they needed, water. Everything was there for them. But they were miserable, grumbling, complaining the whole time. They didn't want his will. They wanted their own will. They wanted their will. Yeah, we want the blessing. Well, here, here, God, you deliver us. Take us over to this new land, and you wipe them all out and just let us be there. That's right. And give us a king, by the way. And give us a king. Yep, and they cry for the king. You see all of these things, and God was God drew the line, and he gave them this cup of his fury. And he says, but now you'll no longer drink it. I'm going to put it into your oppressor's hands, those who afflict you. And, you know, and here's the other thing, too. This last verse... Um, or well, last part of, of, of 23. He says, who have, who have said to you, lie down that we may walk over you, and you laid your body like the ground as a street for those who walk over. It's almost to the point where he's saying, you know, you came to this point where you're just willing to lay down. Mm-hmm. He said, so I'm done with the fury. I'm going to remove that fury. I'm going to redistribute into somebody else's hands. So basically... Earlier we read Israel's calling for God to wake up, but here God is calling them to wake up. And he said they're drunk, but not with wine. The cup of his fury because of their sin and rebellion. What do I see in, this, in these passages? I see mercy, mercy, mercy. Yeah, many people suffered. Many people died at the hands of, of the enemy. Many people were put into captivity and, and were punished and beaten and enslaved and lived a horrible lives but it was by their own hand and this is something that the church really needs to grasp today we are in a position right now where we can get on our knees get our hearts right with God individually and then corporately it follows and we turn away from the prosperity garbage and we turn away from the from the me 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 stuff that's crept in the front door of the church and we turn away from all of that stuff and get back to God mm-hmm. and that relationship with him who knows what he may decide to do. Mm. But if we don't, I can tell you what's coming. The cup of his fury. <laughs> and while it may not be the great tribulation, 
He can bring this country to nothing. Mm -hmm. And we could be squanderers trying to figure out how to get our next meal mm. because of the sin that is so prevalent in our world today, in the country today, in the government today, and unfortunately in the church today. We need to wake up. God is calling us to wake up as he's called them to wake up. Listen, I know who I am. That's what God says. I know what I've done. And I know I've got you right where I want you, but do you want me? Mm -hmm. Do you want me? That's a question that we need to really ask ourselves. And I, I challenge the church as a whole, anyone who listens to this message, I challenge the church as a whole. Do you want God? Do you want him or do you want to try to keep hanging on to whatever you can over here, your 401k, your, 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 your money, your power, whatever you might have? Are you willing to say, I trust you with my eternity, I can trust you with today? And that's what he wants us to come to. He wanted them to come to it. And he does say here that he's given them that mercy. But we also know where they are today. They're following Jehovah, but they're not following Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Israel is going to suffer even more because of decisions they've made up to this yeah. point. But hey, we have hope. Amen. We, can, we can close on a hopeful note. Jesus is coming again. And he's going he's gonna to bring that sword with him. And he's going to bring that righteousness with him. And I look forward to it. But we have today. May not be comfortable, but we can have peace in the middle of it. Let's grab hold of it. Let's hold on to it. Amen. 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 Father, thank you.